Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. You may be seated for a moment. Hallelujah. Can I get a little bit more volume? Thank you. I greet you all today in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. It's a pleasure to be here today, and I want to thank Pastor Yvette Williams and Assistant Pastor and the women's ministry leaders for the opportunity to be a blessing to you. It could not have happened if they didn't hear the voice of God and obey it. And so I don't take this opportunity lightly. It is a pleasure to serve you as unto the Lord. Amen. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Your theme is a very powerful theme. Behold the fire and the wood, but where is your sacrifice? And when I saw the theme, I was like, God, I need you. <laughs> it is not one of those simple ones that you could probably look at and say, I know what I will say. But it says, behold the fire and the wood, but where is your sacrifice? And you are well aware of the theme scripture as it pertains to God and his relationship with Abraham. And so the Bible makes known that Abraham was born in Ur of the Chaldees, which was the center of idolatry, and that he was an idol worshiper. It also reveals in Genesis 11.30 that Abraham married Sarah in Ur, and she was barren. The New Testament and historical calculations imply that God's original call or his first call to Abraham was in Ur when he was 60 years old. Acts chapter 7 verses 2 to 3 states, The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran and said to him, Get out of your country and from your relatives and come to a land that I will show you. Abraham obeyed God. And he and his family left Ur and started traveling by faith to the land the Lord would show him. But they stopped in Haran for 15 years in disobedience to God. And Sarah was still barren. It's very important that as believers, whatever God tells you to do, do it. And don't make any adjustments to the plan of God because you will mess your life your purpose and your destiny up. 15 years is a very long time to be in disobedience to what God has said. Genesis chapter 12 verse 1 records God's second call to Abraham at the age of 75. Similar to the first call, God commanded Abraham to leave Haran and to go to Canaan, and Abraham did as the Lord instructed. In Hebrews 11 verse 8 it says, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place he would receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. It was a walk of faith. This Christian life is a walk of faith. The Bible tells us that we walk by faith and not by sight. And the thing with God is, he doesn't tell us all of everything. He just tells us enough to get us going. So we see that Abraham followed and obeyed God by faith every step of the journey to the promised land. Could you imagine if God tells you to book a flight to Canada? And, and all you know is that you're going to Canada and you go to the airport and you come through customs and you don't know where you are going. But then a taxi pulls up and says, um, I'm taking you to such and such a place. And you're like, God, is this you? Is it not you? Abraham is following. 
He doesn't know specifically where he is going. All he knows is God has given me a command and tell me to follow him and I am going to arrive at the destination that he has chosen for me. It takes faith. The Hebrew word for faith is imuna and it means a firm persuasion. Steadfastly strong minded. Certainty total dependence in God. It means to have an unquestioning belief in God that does not require proof or evidence. In other words, when God gives you an instruction, you don't tell God you need to give me a life plan, how things are going to work out. When I leave my job, how am I going to maintain medical insurance? Who is going to support me every month? You take God at his word, you believe, and you put all your trust in God, and you continue to hope. That word hope means confident expectation. You expect God to deliver, and that is exactly what Abraham did when he left the known for the unknown, so to speak, and the sure for what others will call unsure. You see, when he left Mesopotamia, he left with his father and family. And his father decided that he wanted to stay in Haran. And Abraham stayed there. There's some people that you may need to drop off when God tells you, come follow me. Because there are those, if you are still attached to them, they will discourage you from doing all that God has called you to do. The way God got me here was on vacation. I left my job and came on vacation and then God revealed his perfect will for my life. But then it came a point in time when life was challenging and the pain was great. And I said I was going to call my mother and tell her what was happening to me. I wanted to hear my mother's soothing voice. I wanted to hear my mother tell me, don't take it. Come back home. I will see to it that everything is all right. I wanted my mother. I wanted my mother. And the Lord said to me, you can't call your mother. He said, if you call your mother, she's going to entice you to come back home because she does not understand the call that I have on your life. I stood there. In my home and I began to cry tears of surrender to God because I knew he was right. And that was what I wanted to hear at the time. Somebody taking a stand for me and saying, you don't have to suffer like that. You don't have to take that kind of discomfort. Come back to where you were born. Abraham, father, made him spend 15 years in disobedience to God. It was only when his father died and God came again the second time and said to Abraham, get thee up and follow me, that he did it this time. And so Genesis chapter 12 verse 5 to 10 tells us that Abraham entered Canaan and lived there for eight years or until there was a famine in the land and then he decided that he will go to Egypt to get food. Genesis 12 verse 10, the latter part tells us that Abraham and Sarah arrived in Egypt and stayed there for about five years. You must take note that God did not instruct Abraham to go to Egypt. But he made a decision based on circumstances. Like Pastor was saying, we are not moved by what we see. We are going to obey God. We are going to stand on the word of God because the just must live by faith. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. The Bible tells us that by faith, the elders receive a great report. And if you want to see victory this morning, if you want to get all the things that God promised you, if you want to rise up and be a mighty woman of valor, a mighty man of valor, faith is involved in it. Because when you don't even understand, when you can't even see the next month, 
oil in front of you you've got to believe that God has gone over before you as a consuming fire and he will bring down giants and fortify things and principalities and power you've got to believe when life is real that God is indeed a way maker a promise keeper and he's light in the darkness and when others are telling you don't go there has to be something deep inside of you or the Holy Ghost deep inside of you telling you go on walk on trust God obey God look and live hallelujah the biblical narrative makes known that 10 years after Abraham and Sarah moved back to Canaan from Egypt Sarah continued to struggle to conceive or that she was still barren even Sarah said to Abraham in Genesis 16 2, she said see now the Lord has restrained me from bearing children the scriptures confirm that Abraham was a man of faith in Genesis 15, 6. It tells us that Abraham believed in the Lord. Another translation says, Abraham trusted in Yahweh that he would give him a son and God accounted it or reckoned it to him for righteousness. This is confirmed by the Apostle Paul in Galatians 3, 6, where he says, Consider Abraham, he believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. He also says in Romans 4, 19 to 21, he says, Being not weak in faith, Abraham considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded what God had promised God was able also to perform. Sarah has completed menopause. She's not overlating. And Abraham literally can't get anybody pregnant. Not even if he married a 16 year old, which was legal at that time. It still can't be done. But God comes to him and says, you are going to be a father of the son of the promise. You see, when he got here, got pregnant, he was still fertile, but now everything is dead. Not even a gynecologist can do anything. Viagra wouldn't work, it's dead. Because he had come to that phase in life that the creator has set in the body where everything becomes dead after a while. These scriptures are saying that Abraham believed everything God told him and that he never wavered or doubted God's ability to give him what he promised and to do the impossible things he vowed. In other words, Abraham believed the truth of the promise which God made to him. And he was fully persuaded that God was able to fulfill his vow or that God will certainly bring to fruition his irrevocable word to him. That's why his faith rested securely in the power and the faithfulness of God who made the promise to him. There's some things that God would say to us that wouldn't happen in three weeks' time. It wouldn't even happen in a year. Not even five years. And sometimes we tend to think that the prophet was false. But you see, when a word is really of God, it lives on the inside of you. You can't shake it no matter what. And when God told Abraham at a time when it was impossible that he was going to have a son, the Bible tells us that God, that Abraham believed God. And that is what God is looking for, for you and from you and I. But because before we get the fire word and to begin the sacrifice, faith is involved. 
Before you can do whatever God has called you to do, faith is involved. And God never asks any of us to do anything that we are capable of doing. If you can get it done, you don't need God. The moment God makes a command, it is something that you say to God, Lord, I believe, Lord, I will do it, but I need you. I need your help. And Abraham believed. The Bible says, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now the words accounted and reckoned in Genesis 15, 6 are bookkeeping and accounting terms. So what the scriptures is telling us is that when Abraham believed the Lord, that the Lord deputed his account with the child. Do, do you understand what I just said? In accounts, you have two sides. You have debit and you have credit. The credit side is when you owe the bank, the mortgage company, when you have your Macy's credit card, you become a creditor. So that is what you have to pay out. The debit side is a side that has the money. All the CDs, the fixed deposit, your salary, your, your inheritance, that kind of stuff. So when Abraham believed in God, on the debit side of life, God credit debited his account with the son of the promise. Once he believed God, God debited his account. And that is exactly what happens for you and I, Christians. The moment you really believe what God has said, it goes directly into your account like a cell or a bank transfer. Your payroll goes into your account. The moment you believe God, that thing is debited to your account. And so the Bible lets us know that from the very instant when Abraham was 75 years old, all and could still get somebody pregnant that he believed God that he will give him a specific son, a son of the promise. It was debited to his account. And the same thing with you and I today, whatever God has said to us uh, whether it's three years ago, five years ago, ten years ago, the moment God said it and you believe it, it was debited to your account. Uh, but you have to continue believing uh, until the time The writer of Hebrews tells us that because there's nobody greater than God, he swore by himself. He said because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the ears of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it's impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope offered to us may be greatly encouraged. Now God made the promise to Abraham by two immutable things, which is the promise and the oath. The promise pledge God's trustworthiness and faithfulness. Abraham, you can go to the bank with this because I am going to do it. And the oath promised God's unlimited resources. He swore by himself as the creator of life and the creator of this earth. He says, Abraham, what I am promising you, it is not going to fail. It shall come to pass. And Abraham believed the word of God. Samuel said to the children of Israel in 1 Samuel 15, 29, he said, he who is the glory of Israel does not lie or change his mind, for he is not a man that he shall lie or that he should change his mind. Psalm 33, 11 says, the counsel of the Lord stands forever. We're talking about an old covenant where Abraham didn't have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit would come to speak and then leave. But Abraham believed the word of God. And so today, if you are going to offer up your sacrifice, if you are going to see a move of God, you have to believe what God says. 
And so after 25 years of personally longing and waiting to be parents of the son of the promise, the Bible tells us when Sarah was 90 years old and Abraham was 100 years old, the Lord said to him in Genesis 18.10, he says, I will surely return to you according to the time of life and behold, Sarah shall have a son. In other words, after 25 years, God said to Abraham, the set time is approaching for me to bless you with the son of the promise. Could you imagine? When everything looked dismal, God is now ready to act so that there must be no denial inside or outside that this is the child that God has chosen. So it's time to be blessed. Most Christians are of the belief that all of God's blessings are a reward for past obedience and generosity to others. But sometimes the blessing you receive from the Lord is in preparation for a future tests. You see, God knows exactly what is going to happen in our lives at any given time. And many times to prepare us for the trial, God will send a blessing before a test or a trial so that when you are hurting and discouraged or are questioning God, you can look back at the past blessing and say, the same God that helped me when I didn't have a job, he's going to see me through. Or the God that healed me, when the doctor said I would have to live with my condition it's the same God that will deliver me out of my predicament and give me the victory it is only when you look back in a bad way like Lot's wife wanting the things of the world that it is wrong but sometimes uh, when new tests and trials come uh, what God did in the past uh, if you use it as firewood uh, it will help you to stay strong in the test uh, my God of mercy when you get healed of cancer and now the doctor says that there's a, a tumor you know the God of cancer is the God of of tumor when you didn't have a job and God gave you a job you know that a pink slip wouldn't frighten you God is looking at you for you to say the God that gave me this job will give me another one you see the difference between the believer, the difference between the Christian and the world is we have an anchor that keeps the soul. We have a God that does not fail. The right hand of God doeth valiantly, it never fails. Politicians fail. World leaders fail. Sometimes parents fail. Man feels, but God never fails. And the thing about faith is, sometimes God will say things or tell us to do things that does not make sense. When I was a bit younger in the faith, <laughs> I could think of a couple times I just sat down and began to school God. And I say that reverently and only for you to understand what I mean. But I would say to God, that's not how we do it on earth. This is the way it is done. It's not that complicated for you to be taking so long to solve the problem. I mean, if I got up now and I did so and so, it would be done. This is how we do it. So, you know, get up and act. But God is in charge. And God is in control. And I thank God for the grace of God that helped me still to trust and obey God. Because when God did it, if he had done it how we do it on earth, I would have been in serious trouble. Living this life demands that we trust God. So God finally blesses Abraham with the son of the promise. He had blessed Abraham with money 
and cattle. The Bible tells us that Abraham was rich in gold and, and silver and he had all kinds of cattle and herd. He had everything. Abraham was a multi-millionaire but the one thing that he wanted, God put a delay or hold on it. So the time came. And the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 21 verses 1 to 4, hallelujah, that God was true to his word. And after decades of waiting in faith on the promise God made to him, hallelujah, the son of the promise became a reality to Abraham. In other words, the manifestation of what God had debited to Abraham account 25 years earlier became a tangible reality 25 years later. All along when Abraham was fertile and waiting on the promise, Isaac was sitting down in his account. But he couldn't come until the appointed time. You see, God don't rush to have pregnancies because children are born specifically, especially those that God did foreknew would be his, were born specifically at the appointed time to serve God in the generations. When I didn't know any better, I used to say, I wish I was born a little later. Because I wanted to be a movie star. So if I was born a little later, now opportunities, you know, are, are, are prevalent and you don't have to be, you know, from a, such and such a family, I would have been a movie star. But God decided it was going to be 1958 for me because I was to be here this morning preaching the word. And for that I am grateful that when God debited me to my mother's account, he chose the date, the time, the country and the era because God had a plan and God had a purpose. And when we continue to live accusing God of not allowing us to live our lives, we are not understanding that we are literally God's property and God has a plan and a purpose for each of us and so Isaac came uh, at the right time Ishmael uh, was not the one even though Abraham stood in the presence of God and he begged God he said may Ishmael live in thy sight and God said I accept Ishmael as your son and I will bless him but he is not the one the son of the promise I want must come from you and Sarah and God did it in the end so Abraham has his blessing from God. He got his love child. He got the son of the promise. The progenitor of the Jewish race that he delighted in with all his heart. And then God made an unusual or an uncharacteristic request of him. Or God gave him a great test that demanded the God kind of faith. Now remember when, when Sarah went to Abraham and said, listen, that boy of yours, Ishmael, he has to leave this house and with his mother. Abraham grappled with it. And God said to Abraham, Sarah is right. The boy needs to go. Could you imagine now? that Abraham has the one that he really wants. Genesis 22, 1 to 2 tells us, Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am, God. And then God said to Abraham, Take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. Listen to what the scripture says. He says now, take your only son, your only begotten son, the one son that you have. Because Ishmael is not in the picture. And then God says, the one son whom you love. Hmm. And go to Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering. Doesn't that sound like John 3.16 to you? 
God gave his only begotten son as a living sacrifice on Calvary that you and I might have life and have it more abundantly. God knew that Abraham loved this boy with all his heart and with all his life. Uh, that he was his only son. That Ishmael was not going to come back to replace him. And he said to him, take him and sacrifice him. What God requires of Abraham, he requires of us at times. Now some people tend to think that Isaac was some kind of three-year-old or five-year-old child. But Isaac was about 25 to 30 years old. And the Bible tells us immediately Abraham obeyed God and he got Isaac and he took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son's back in Genesis 22 verse 6. And, Isaac and Abraham took the fire in his hand and the knife and the two of them went together. They climbed the mountain so with all that wood attached to Isaac's back. A little child could not have done that. I want you to know that notice that Abraham is still following God's leading and obeying God by faith at every command. That's why God cannot choose every and anybody to be a pastor. That's why God cannot choose any and everybody to be a leader in the body of Christ because people think it's a glamorous position, but it's a position of sacrifice. It's a position of self-denial. It's a position of labor and it comes with great responsibility because when the rapture takes place and we all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, every pastor will tell God why. So Abraham got his only beloved son together to go walk the distance to go to Mount Moriah. Just as Abraham was not weak in faith when God told him to leave his country and family and follow him to a land where he would show him and Abraham obeyed. Just as Abraham did not stagger in his faith through unbelief when God told him he would have a son at a time when he could no longer get anyone pregnant. Just as Abraham was just as strong in faith, he was just as strong in faith the day when God told him to sacrifice sacrifice Isaac his faith didn't stagger he was determined he was going to obey God obey God at a time when you think that his faith would dip Abraham is willing to do what God told him to do he was solid in faith when he built that altar and he tied Isaac to the firewood on the altar. Genesis 22 verses 9 to 10 tells us. And Abraham built the altar there. And placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac his son. And laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham lifted up his hand and took the knife to slay his son. You see the measure of the strength of a man's faith. Always is ultimately the measure of his knowledge of God. That is, he knows God so well that he can rest in his word. You really have to know God. Job said to God in his encounter, I had only heard of you, but I never knew you. But now I am seeing you. I understand that I have spoken foolish things. Abraham knew God personally. And he had complete trust and faith in God. It must be noted that God is the one who brought Abraham to his altar of great testing. It wasn't Abraham's disobedience. It wasn't his enemies. And it wasn't the devil. It was the doing of the Lord. It was the Lord's doing. And it was marvelous in his eyes. 
God didn't make this request of Abraham because he needed to prove to himself that Abraham totally believed in him since he knows all things. God's purpose for testing Abraham's faith was to prove to Abraham or to show him that his faith was real, that he truly loved him with all his soul and that he had met the criteria to be the spiritual father of the nations of the world. In other words, Abraham's obedience demonstrated his trust in God's integrity, his goodness and loving kindness, and his complete surrender and submission in doing whatever God required of him, as well as living a, a holy life that pleased God. Abraham believed God. He had complete faith in God. Mm. Hebrews 11, chapter 17. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17 to 19 says, By faith, when he was tested, Abraham offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promise offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said in Isaac, Your seed shall be called. Concluding that God was able to raise him even from the dead. That is how much faith Abraham had. He had never heard of a resurrection before. But Abraham was believing that God would bring his son back from the dead. He was willing to sacrifice his son because his faith was in the goodness and the faithfulness of God. That God was not going to give me a son and then take his life forever. Abraham's actions demonstrated an incredible level of faith and trust in God. It also showed that Abraham truly believed that God is good and that he, that he had his best interests at heart. God had his own sacrifice prepared for Abraham to offer up to him. Since the test was not about human sacrifice, it was about Abraham's unwavering and relentless faith and trust in God. Notice Abraham is still following God's leading and obeying God by faith at every command. And as Abraham raised his hand with the knife, ready to sacrifice his son, the Lord spoke to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he answered again, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not befell your son, your only son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked and behold behind him was a ram caught in the thicket. Abraham obeyed God. In the scripture, Isaac said to his father, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the sacrifice? And Isaac said this because he did not know that what God really wanted was for father and son to be totally submitted to his will, for them to see that they love God more than life itself, and that God was sending a message to you and I about the coming of his son who would be the savior of the world. The entire passages I read are typology of who God is and what God did. I want to say to you today that it is one thing to know theologically what faith means. And it means a firm persuasion. It means that you are steadfastly strong minded. That you are not going to back down and change your mind about what you know God said to you. That you are not going to recant. That you are not going to supplant your will over against God's will. It is one thing to know what faith does. Faith moves mountains. It's another thing to really have to live by faith when you are experiencing the challenges of life. 
Careful attention must be drawn to the fact that God is the one who led Abraham to the land he showed him to live among or to live in the midst of the dangerous warlike tribes who dwelt there to the severe famine in Canaan and to Mount Moriah where he was tested in sacrificing the son of the promise and so similarly when a believer is living in obedience to Isaiah 58 11 it says the Lord will continually lead you uh, and living according to Proverbs 3 6 uh, in all thy ways acknowledge him uh, and he will direct your paths uh, Psalm 32 8 God says I will instruct you and teach you in the way you shall go uh, and I will guide you with my eye uh, and Psalm 25 12 says who is the man that fears the Lord him shall he teach in the way he shall choose uh, that God will lead you to your Mount Moriah situation just like he did Abraham. If your life today is totally and completely submitted to the will of God, God has a Mount Moriah plan for you because Mount Moriah is symbolic of the test or the trial God will lead you to and you must be willing like Abraham to do exactly as the Lord instructs you. There is a Mount Moriah. In the Old and New Testament, the word translated as test means to prove by trial. God always tests his covenant children for them to see if they are willing to put their faith, their trust and hope completely in him in the hardest times of their lives. And if they are willing to follow his instructions in doing whatever he leads them to do, going wherever he leads them and to whatever he leads them to, even when it seems foolish. There is a Mount Moriah planned for you and I. When God tries his children, his purpose is to prove that you, your faith is real and that you are totally committed and steadfastly strong-minded in serving him alone as God. We are living in a day and time when pressure is placed upon the church of the living God for you and I to compromise, for you and I to condone what God has condemned, for you and I to agree with what the spirit of Antichrist wants. There is a Mount Moriah for the church. It may not be your son or daughter, but it may be your persuasion that for God I live and for God I die. God tests us solely to prove to us and to reveal to us that our faith is genuine and unshakable by life's dangerous circumstances. That like Job, we are completely sold out to him, no matter what the cost. In other words, uh, the same God that blessed you with a lot uh, can cause you to end up with a little. God tests us so that we will know that we are truly his children. That there's no trial that will overcome our faith uh, because God is always with us and for us. Whatever comes to you, God and you can handle it. You know, I believe that sometimes as Christians, we tend to think that when we say all we have is God, that we are outnumbered. Or that we don't really have anyone of standing with us. Some people feel more confident when they have an expensive lawyer. Some people feel better sick. When they have, uh, you know, exclusive medical insurance that will not deny them anything at all that they want. They can get the real medication and not the dupe or the counterfeit. But I want you to know today that in life, uh, if God is with you, you are on the right side, you are on the winning side. You have everything that you need uh, because God has never failed. There is no failure in God. He's dependable. Even when you are asleep, God is working in your behalf. Even when you don't.
all know that danger is lurking. God is on the scene protecting you. I want you to know that the reason for the test is all about God revealing himself and his will for your life to you. It's about God proving you, evaluating you, and equipping you for ministry so that you can become who God wants you to be and be found fit to do all that God has called you to do. I came to this country anointed and on fire. You know, the major thing that I needed that I didn't have was faith. On the one hand, yes, I believe God, but I didn't have faith. Because I had a job, and so I never trusted God for anything. I used my salary to get what I wanted in life. But then I found myself with no job, no salary. No family, no friends, no missionary board, no money coming from nowhere. Literally nothing at all and knowing no one in a strange land. It was then that I had no other choice but to trust God. I literally had no other choice but to trust God. And I started out in fear and trembling. Believing that God will give me each day my daily bread. And I am here today to tell you now that I know who I believe in. And I am persuaded that God is able. And I'm standing here today telling you that if you put your faith and your trust in God. When your Mount Moriah situation comes. That you will be able to be like Abraham and trust God and follow him all the way. Even when you don't understand. Even when you don't see why God will make such a request of you. I want you to know that God sends tests in our lives not to destroy our confidence in him but to strengthen and increase our faith to increase our spiritual growth to reveal himself to us and to bless us tremendously. It must be noted that our tests and trials are God's vote of confidence in us. Daily, when you look at YouTube or Facebook, because those are the only two I have, you see people discounting the word of God. All of a sudden, a new breed of men are risen, have risen up who are against women as pastors. One leading theologian and pastor in this country says, a woman pastor is a disgrace to the kingdom of God. But I live by the court of a well-known Christian theologian. He says a man with an experience is not at the mercy of a man with an opinion. And it's going to take real raw faith to live in 2024 and beyond. James 1, 2 to 3 tells us, consider it all joy. My brother, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the... Testing of your faith produces endurance. First Peter 1, 6 to 7 says, In this greatly rejoice that though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the trial of your faith be a much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tried, tested by fire, may be found unto the praise, the honor, and the glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Peter says again in chapter 4 verses 12 to 30. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trials which is to try you. As though some strange thing has happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering. And when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. What is God saying to you this morning? He's saying, just like Abraham, tests will come. See, God will test you by bringing you to a place where you really have to know who you believe in. 
or that you are or that you truly know and believe in God no matter how rough lives get knowing God trusting in him and being a recipient of his amazing grace is what enables the believer to be willing like Abraham to go through the test it's one thing to talk about faith. It's another thing to have faith. I remember one of the last times when I was evicted. Whenever God would give me somewhere to live, the enemy would get mad at my preaching and my life. And he would just influence the person not to like me anymore. It was 10 o'clock in the night, nowhere to go, no money, no storage, nothing. Didn't do anything wrong, didn't owe any rent, just living for Jesus. And I was put out on the streets. But I know who I believe in. And I know it was a testing of my faith. I didn't call a hundred and one people I said God when Mary and Joseph needed somewhere you found room in a manger and the Bible tells me that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and the people that dwell therein which means all these buildings that are owned by various people the title these literally belong to the Lord but he's given you the opportunity to buy an own so somewhere is going to open for me tonight and the spirit gave me a name and I called and two vehicles came and packed me and I was off the street in less than an hour. Because the time it takes to get from point A to point B. God did it. I didn't cry. I didn't mourn. I didn't make a scene. I just waited on the Lord. I'm saying Mount Moriah will come. It's symbolic of your testing. And when Mount Moriah comes, God is looking down and he's looking for faith because believers are known to sing the songs of Zion. We are known to quote the scriptures and to know them. But when our real life experience comes, like Paul on did, and people Peter on dead, hallelujah, Habakkuk on dead, then we begin to fall down, and then we begin to accuse God of not keeping his word, but the Bible did say that many will be the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord will deliver if you don't allow God to groom you in faith today, when your Mount Moriah comes, only God knows what you will do. Daniel 11.32 says, The people who know their God shall be strong and do great exploits. You see, we talk so much about knowing God, but what we really mean is, uh, I'm, I'm familiar with his name in the Bible. But it's not personal. Like really, really personal. Like exclusively personal, you knowing God. Because when you really know him and you have proven his power, when new tests and trials come, you say, God, I know, I know, I know, morning by morning, new mercies I will see. I know in spite of what is approaching me, that goodness and mercy has fallen me all the days of my life. Jeremiah 9.23 says, Let him who glories, glory in this, that he understands and know me, save God, that I am the Lord, exercising love and kindness and judgment and righteousness in the earth, for in these I delight, says the Lord. So God is saying today, if you are going to brag and boast in anything, it must be that I know the Lord for myself personally. Because when you are counseled to give up, when you are counseled to doubt God, when you are counseled with a demonic slogan, God helps those who help themselves, you should be able to say, I know who I believe in. 
When others tell you it is not going to work, my God of mercy. About three, four months ago, someone presented something to me. And I said to the individual, I am not going to lie. Because the God I serve is a miracle worker. You see, the Bible records lies. But it is not God who was lying. It is those who became afraid in that moment in time and allowed their fear to cause them to lie. But God has never lied in the scripture. But you read of people lying. And so when you know God, and you know that God doesn't have to employ a lie to perform a miracle because when God came into the earth in Genesis 1 and the earth was without form and void, he did not lie to make the sun. He did not lie to make the oceans. He did not lie to create this beautiful earth with everything it has to sustain mankind. God by faith, the Bible says that by faith God framed the world. All God said is let there be let there be let there be and it is if there's going to be any glory today it has to be that I know the Lord because when you know him and you are challenging your faith walk up you are challenged by your unsaved children spouse family friends people on the job you better square your shoulders and let them know listen I know God personally and I know he does not fail he will come through right on time I was laughed at and I was scoffed at. And I was told that nothing would transpire for me unless I tell a lie. I've never had to lie in this country to eat. I've never had to lie to drink. I've never had to lie to get medical attention. I've never had to lie to do anything. Because God has always shown himself strong. Every time I put my faith in God. Every time I got to Mount Moriah. The only choice I had was to believe God. And the only choice you and I have every moment of our lives is to believe the word of the Lord. For by it the elders receive a good report. If you are going to have a testimony, you've got to believe God. Ten spies came back and said, look, we saw giants. We saw the people. We are as good as dead. Two people said, listen, we are well able. God is able. You see there, the ten was looking at their human ability to possess uh, the land of Canaan that Abraham uh, possessed uh, hundreds of years before he lived in it. Uh, and two men says, I know God. I know my God is a warrior. For Moses declared the Lord our God is a man of war. They have seen God fought battles for them in the wilderness against the Amalekites and other nations but now they're doubting the ability of God because then Mount Moriah also included a Mount Everest and why God did it that way he wants us to know that there's no God like Jehovah With all the prosperity that many have today, all the fame and popularity, because they bowed down to Baal and the Baphomet and Asherah and the sun and the moon and all the things, they worship the, the, the creature and not the creator. They still don't have what you have. They don't have the peace that you have. They don't have the blessed assurance that all is well. They have money, but they're miserable. They can buy the most expensive thing, but they can't enjoy it. They don't have to scratch their heads over like bill of water, bill of gas, bill a winter cold, college tuition for children. They have money coming through their ears and their noses. They have hookups and connections with world leaders on all kinds of stuff. But what you and I have today, they don't have. We have God. We have victory. We have eternal life. Hallelujah. A joy unspeakable and full of glory. We have an 
an assurance and a guarantee like the Shulamite said that all is well. I want you to tell me today. Tell me what you are going through or facing that God can't handle. Just tell me. Just tell me. He can do anything. He can do everything. Ah, my God have mercy. Paul says in Romans 8, 35 to 39, he says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword, or Mount Moriah? He says, for I'm persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor anything created, shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Nothing. Doesn't matter who is out there. The Christian press doing statistics. About how many churches are closed. And how many pastors are depressed. It's impossible for a pastor that is living in the spirit to be depressed. I know depressed is a demon. And the enemy will try to throw it on you. But when you sense it, you've got power and authority to rebuke it discouragement will come I know it will come but when you sense it you know it's not a fruit of the spirit so you rebuke it Mount Moriah will come people will die a wife will die a husband will die parents will die children will die money will decrease all kinds of things happen but none of these things shall move you when you have faith in God when God is your Jehovah Chira when God is because the Lord is my shepherd I lack nothing when God is your provider when he's your El Shaddai the God that is more than enough you don't let the echo Economic situation cause you to become so discouraged that you can't praise God when you go to the supermarket and a hundred dollars is now only giving you fifty dollars in full. Buy it, bless it, and watch God stretch it. I've never murmured in the supermarket. I go with what I have and buy what it could buy and eat and wait for the next blessing. So if what I buy feed me from Monday to Wednesday, when Wednesday come, I'm looking to God to give me what I would need for Thursday, Friday, and Saturday because he's my provider. He's my provider. I don't have to borrow money that I can't pay back. I don't have to lie. I don't have to go and put myself in debt that I shouldn't. He made a promise to me. And that's why many Christians aren't seeing God the way he wants to show himself to them. Because you're not using your faith and allowing God to show himself strong. There are too many believers who don't want to experience their resisting the test and the trials of the Lord because they want to live a, a test free and a trouble free life. It's naive for a believer to think that he will not be tested at some point in time in his Christian walk with God. We've got to be willing to accept our tests and trials just like we accept the blessings of God. You know, to whom much is given, much is expected. But sometimes you can find yourself in an emergency room. And it is just you alone. You've got to know God for yourself. I remember preaching on a Mother's Day and sitting in the vehicle waiting to be taken home. And a car drove right into it. And then I was in an ambulance all by myself with my luggage bag with my change of clothes my ministry bag I had about three bags that day because I was given some extra food and I'm in an ambulance no one was in it with me but I knew that God was there I had nothing to complain about 
I didn't see myself disadvantaged or in a predicament because I know that God tests us. You're going to get some kind of surgery and they're going to put you to sleep. I have to be sure that God is watching over me when I can't wake up and say, stop what you are doing. And as they're doing what they're doing, I'm saying, God, my life is in your hands. Watch over me. Whatever they're doing, give them the wisdom to do it because I expect to wake up and everything is all right. Remember having a surgery done on my back and somebody said to me, you know, when you do back surgery, you'll never be able to walk again. Almost scared me from doing it, but I had to keep my faith in God. And I remember getting up, somebody waking me up and saying to me, uh, what is your name? And I said, my name. And then I remembered what I had come in for. And the first thing I started to do was to move the hands and the feet. Because if my body didn't have what God created me with, we were going to have an all night prayer meeting. Right in there I walk in and I intended to walk back out. Because I had committed my care and my well-being into the hands of the great physician. And that is what we have to do when our Mariah is a sickness. You've got to go to Jehovah Rapha Because he made you not man He knows everything about the human body Your theme or your question is Behold the fire and the wood But where is your sacrifice? The fire and the wood is symbolic of the preparation needed to give the sacrifice to God. And the sacrifice is the thing God has asked you for that you must be willing to wholeheartedly give to the Lord. Just like Abraham, there are times when our greatest test comes after a rich blessing from the Lord. And the Bible tells us that Queen Esther, the slave girl, was elevated to the highest position of queen. And then God brought Queen Esther to the place of testing with a death decree. All the Jews are to be killed. Mount Moriah was the law of the Medes and the Persians. I can't go to my husband, the king, unless he calls me. Because if I don't find favor in his eyes, I could be a dead woman. But like Isaac, she was willing to die to fulfill God's will for the salvation of his people. The firewood is symbolic of the preparation of the sacrifice that you are going to be asked to make for God. And the sacrifice is your willingness to tell God yes. You see, sometimes when God comes and asks us for sacrifice, we begin to tell God it is too much. And we want to give God a portion. But when God comes for all, he means what he says. I want all. Sometimes we give God what we don't value because we don't want to release what God is saying. And when Christians hold on to what God is asking for, they don't get to see the hand of God move for them. You don't get to see the power of God in your behalf. When David went to offer his sacrifice, Arona said to him, I will give you the animal and the wood, everything you need. And David said, uh, I will not offer anything that costs me nothing. Tell me the real price, the exact price. Because this sacrifice is for my God and he must get the blessing. The question being asked today is, what is God asking you for that you have to sacrifice at your Mount Moriah? The Bible tells us for over 10 years, Hannah was barren. And then one year she stood at the altar of God and being endued and anointed by the Holy Spirit, she made the vow that God wanted her to vow. She said, if you bless me with just one child, a male child, 
I will give him back to you. And God did it. And Hannah kept her word. She weaned that boy and she took him and gave him to Samuel. She had a child, but he was not physically present in her home. And what did God do? When Hannah talked with God at her Mount Moriah and she gave him the sacrifice, God replenished Hannah with five more children. I have learned in this journey that when God comes to us for sacrifice, it's because he has something greater, something bigger, something better. God is not like those scammers within Christendom that comes for your $100 and your $10,000. He's not like those that come to rob you that they can continue to maintain their luxurious lifestyle. Whenever God comes and he asks you for sacrifice, it's because he wants to reveal himself to you. He wants you to see that obedience pays off he wants you to see that faith works yes the times God give us things without us asking it's not a barter system but there's a reason why God does what he does years ago in my beginning walk in faith I was praying for months and telling God I want money to get my hair braided it was a hundred dollars I was praying for months, for months, for the money to get my hair braided. Then Christmas came, and I got two little postcards, and it was $100. I said, yeah, yeah, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus. I'll be able to get my hair braided. And then God told me I was to take my $100 and give it to someone. And I was like, for real? All these months, and now I get it. I have to give it. It was all I had. I didn't have 120, the hundred dollars. And I took it. Thank God for spiritual common sense. I take no credit. I took the hundred dollars and I did what God told me to do. And somebody called me for 500. Jeez, hallelujah. I was able to do the hair and pay the rent and do whatever needed. I was at my Mount Moriah. It was all I had. It was $100. It was all I had. I remember in COVID, I was lying down. And I heard my phone go ping. And when I look, I saw the message icon. And when I look... I saw somebody had blessed me with $300. And I was like, God, you're good, oh. God, you're good. Thank you, Jesus. I was rejoicing. And then all of a sudden, I kept saying, this is my money. This is my money. And I said, but why am I saying this is my money? I don't have to say that. <laughs> I mean, it. If something is yours, you don't have to keep repeating yourself like you're trying to convince yourself that it is your money. And then after I went through all of that, then came the Holy Spirit. The money is not for you. The money is for this individual, but the person that sent you the money don't know the individual, so I sent it via them to you. To say to the individual, I had to do another zeal and send the money off because it was for that individual. What I'm saying is God will test your obedience. He will test your faith. And sometimes there's no blessing in the given, so to speak. And God just wants to, to see that you are an obedient child. What God is wanting from you really is the fruit of obedience. It is not a transactional relationship that we have with the Lord that if you give, you will get. Just like a parent, you want to see obedience in your child. I say come inside or I say sweep the yard. Because you sweep the yard, it doesn't mean I'm going to give you $5. It's obedience. Amen. Obedience is the key to obeying God and to being blessed. And so at times, God will test us. Your theme is behold the fire and the wood, but where's your sacrifice? 
I want you to know that God will lead you to your Mount Moriah where he will test you with unemployment and then give you a job. You know, there's some people who can only declare that God is good if they are employed, but God will test you with unemployment. Your Mount Moriah would be an uh, being unemployed. And you have to praise God. You have to stand on Psalm 31, 90. Oh, how great is that goodness that God has laid up for them that fear him before the sons of men. He will test you like that. And if you trust God and believe that the God that give you the first job will give you a second job and a better job, a higher paying job, it will come sooner than later. Behold the fire and the wood, but where's your sacrifice? God will lead you to your Mount Moriah, where he will test you with hunger and then prove himself to you as Jehovah Jireh. God will do that. And then you find yourself doing like Paul. When there's no food, I'm going to fast today. I'm going to set uh, my affections on things above. God will prove your hunger by you declaring that the Lord is my provider, my supplier, my source, my sustainer, my bringer, my giver, my helper. David said I was young and now I am old and I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. Here's a man that lives in caves and holes and in pastures. He never lived on a farm but in the 15 years he was running up and down the canon and outside of canon from King Saul he was never hungry a day even when Nabal told him he wasn't going to give him food Abigail came with more than enough Behold the fire and the wood, but where is your sacrifice? God will lead you to your Mount Moriah. He will test you with an eviction notice, and then he will buy you a house. Because sometimes, it is only when you get evicted that you say, You see me? I'm through with this nonsense. I want to own my own property. Sometimes God does things like that to get us where he wants us to be. Hallelujah. Behold the fire and the wood. But where is your sacrifice? God will lead you to your Mount Moriah where he will test you with sickness and then heal you. You go back and all the test shows that nothing is wrong with your body. Because God has sworn, uh, I am the Lord that heals you. Behold the fire and the wood, but where is your sacrifice? God will lead you to your Mount Moriah, where he will test you with family problems and then solve them. Because every mountain that God brings us to, it also has to do with your transformation. It is how you approach the mountain that determines what is going to happen when you build the altar and spread out the firewood. You see, Abraham left home with faith in God's goodness and faithfulness and with an expectancy that when I do this, God is going to do that. And so God is looking at each of us today, even those of you that are online. And he knows exactly what each of us is going through. You are at your Mount Moriah. For some of you, it may be an immigration situation. A pending divorce that you don't want. Your children might have backslidden or a child. Financial situation, a medical situation, whatever your Mount Moriah is today, as you approach it, you must approach it in faith with an expectation of salvation and deliverance, a miracle from God in the name of Jesus. The Mount Moriah that you see today, you don't have to see it. 
when the benediction is given today. The Mariah that you see today, you don't have to see it tomorrow or the beginning of September because you are determined like Abraham to walk every step of the mountain and build the altar and at your altar you stand there and you declare that I know who I believe in. I'm persuaded that my God is able to deliver. He's able to heal. He's able to provide. He's able to bless you must put your faith and trust in God because if you really look at it you will see that the devil has nothing to do with it every bad thing that we call a bad thing is not of the devil are you hearing me the devil was allowed to do what he did to Job, but God gave the permission. He couldn't touch Job in any way unless God did it. But he was bragging and boasting in Job. And the devil was accusing Job of only serving God for money and wealth. And when he took it, Job said, naked I come into the world, naked I leave. And he bowed down and he worshipped God because he loved God. And sometimes the reason why we are Mount Moriah is because of the idols in our lives. We are worshipping people and not God. We are looking to systems and not God as our source and provider. And so when we hear they're cutting back on this, I heard a sister yesterday say her medical thing that she has has become lesser now. She has to look to spend more money to get medical attention and, and, and it's okay to have it. But when you know that God is your healer, whatever they're taking away, you know God is not taking away anything from you. If the interest rate is higher on debt, you know that God is still your source and sustainer. And what God wants each of us to do is to look to the hills from whence cometh our help. Don't look to the world's systems. They will all fail. They will all fail. But when you keep your eyes on God, and you say to God, I will do what you're asking me to do. God is looking for Christians to be more committed and dedicated to coming to church and to serving in the church. He wants you to leave your home, to come from behind the camera and come back into the house of God that he built for us to congregate, to worship him and to praise him. Maybe your Mount Moriah today is the lie that a lot of mega preachers are saying that tithing is not for today. But the Bible tells us in Galatians that anything that existed before the law, the law cannot nullify. And tithing was before the law. Tithing started outside the Garden of Eden. Tithing is still for today. And so if you love God and you love the work uh, that this church is doing, you brother bring the full 10% uh, on the whole income that you are being paid before your taxes are taken out and give your tithes and offering into the house of God because many Christians who believe in tithing are no are no tested at Mount Moriah and given a tenth. But they'll tell you don't pay a tenth because they want to come and tell you how much money and grace given that you must give. They want the 90% from you and you keep the 10. But people that know God and people that know the word and people who belong to a church like this, that the foundation is built upon the principles that God has set out in his word. You know that you are to give. Because God's word still stands. It doesn't matter what fresh demonic revelation people are getting today. The word of God is forever settled in heaven. Behold the firewood. Which is Mount Moriah. But where is the sacrifice? That thing that God is calling you to do. Stand with me please in the presence of God. I want you to do what David did. He said, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, O Savior, and know my thoughts. 
See if there be any kind of wrong way in me, uneven way in me. Cleanse me and set me free. I want you to examine yourself today. Because this was not a careless theme or something the women's department put together just to make today seem auspicious. But this is God speaking to you. Behold, there's a Mount Moriah that you're facing. But what is a sacrifice? Sometimes a sacrifice could be God just saying, you need to live by faith. I want you to believe in me. There's so many promises that are made by social media. So many commercials. Buy this and you'll be 10 years younger. Try this food. And the antioxidant will keep disease out of your body. But there's still sickness. And we believe all the, the things that we hear that are factual, medically proven or proven in one way or another. The word of the Lord stands secure. Whose report are you going to believe this morning? Who are you going to trust in this morning? Who are you going to put your faith in this afternoon? I see some mature women and men in this building. My maturity is covered. You can't see it. But I know mothers and fathers. The Bible calls you the aged women or the mothers in the church. That through many dangers, toils, and snares you have already come. And it is the grace of God that has brought you safe thus far. I know it's your faith that has been anchored in God. That has kept you in the house of God. In spite of the storm winds that blew upon you. But the battle is not over yet. There's still other storms to come. Because Jesus got up and spoke to one storm and said, peace be still. And there was yet another storm that he had to face. But I can hear God saying clearly. I want you to trust me. I want you to put your faith in me. I want you to believe. That I am your way maker. I'm your promise keeper. I'm your helper and your anchor. I am your rock and your salvation. I am your Jehovah Jireh. I'm Jehovah Shammah. The God that is always there with you. I am your God. I am your father. Father, they're all, father today all of us including myself we stand in your presence and father we surrender to your lordship whatever you want us to give god we are going to give it money material things whatever you want us to give god we will give it father whatever you want us to do we are going to do it you may have to get up at 5 a.m. in the morning to take somebody to their job. Yes, it is hard, but you're saying to God, I am going to do what you want me to do. For the Bible tells us not to get weary and well-doing. Sometimes we get tired cooking for the church, cleaning the church, driving the church bus. We get tired as a secretary. Another flyer, another flyer, another program. Sometimes people even get tired coming to the house of God. God, whatever you want me to do, I'm going to be like Abraham. Where you lead me, I will go. Whatever you want me to do, whatever you want me to give, I will give. Some people are saying, I don't want to dedicate or commit myself to an area of ministry because it's going to take away my time. I want my life for myself, but God, I will answer the call today. Whatever you say, I will do it. Yes, God, I will do it. 
I will give what you ask me to give. I will do what you ask me to do. And I will serve where you ask me to serve. Father, we surrender. We've forgotten that the life we now live is no longer ours, but it is Christ that lives within us. God, I'm not going to murmur and complain that I am the only faithful one. I thank you, God, that you've given me the grace to be faithful. Yes, God. Yes, God, I trust you. Father, I am going to be your Aaron and her in holding up the hands of the pastors of this great church because they cannot do it by themselves. Lord, I'm going to get back to prayer and fasting. I want to see the sanctuary filled. I'm going to pray in you believers. I'm going to pray people out of the occult and off the streets into the house of God. For the great commission is still in effect and we are all called to be fishers of men. I'm going to do it, God. The theme is all about a man being asked to make a sacrifice to give the best he had and all that he had and God is asking you to do the same give the best you have and all that you have give yourself when you're tired give yourself when you're weak give yourself when you feel you're not anointed to do it but because you know your servant sanctify yet will I do it Father, today I thank you for the grace that has descended upon the men and the women in this sanctuary and those that are lying. I pray, God, in the name of Jesus, that this anointing that you have released will provoke your people to sacrifice, to follow your lead and to listen to your voice and do all that you've called them to do. I don't know if this church has a financial need. But if there is a financial need in terms of thousands, God is expecting you to give. God is expecting you to give into the needs in this church. We're so quick to do a zeal and a cash up to a false prophet even far away from America and neglect our own house. Your pastors should not be in need. The light bill of this church should not be in arrears, the water bill, the gas bill, the mortgage if there's any. The insurance on the building should not be in arrears. Nothing that this church is financially obligated to should not be in arrears. It should have a testimony in the commercial world of a church that keeps its vow. God, I'm going to give. I am going to give. I am going to give my best sacrifice. Father, I thank you for stirring your people today. I thank you that mother is giving a little bit more out of her pension. The widow's might out of the pension. I thank you that people are going into their pension fund. And they're giving. I don't have this in my notes. I haven't even spoken to pastor yet. She was in the pulpit when I got here. I'm just saying what I hear. Because everybody's securing their own future. And their own boat cruise. And they're not thinking about God. God is saying, I want you to give. And I want you to put faith in me. Because there's no one, you look in the scripture, no one that has ever given to God that has come out broke. When the widow woman went to Elisha, she said, you know my husband, the man of God. She was speaking about Obadiah, who was the prime minister to King Ahab, that borrowed money from his kingdom to feed a hundred prophets and he died and left a debt what did God do 
he cleared the debt and give her money to live on. God is asking this morning for giving and he's asking you to put your faith and your trust and your hope in him to expect that his word will come to pass to surrender your life and your service to him because he wants to use you. So now, Father, bless. Bless, as your people say yes. Bless God as they surrender. Bless, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. And I thank you for the peace of God that is resting upon you. As you are surrendering, the peace of God is coming. That peace is proof that you are doing what God wants you to do. I thank you, God, that they are blessed. That you are making the provision for them to do it. For you give seed to the sore and bread to the eater. May your grace and your peace and your strength and your faith rest and abide with your people. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And amen. God bless you, pastors coming. Bless the name of the Lord. Bless the name of the Lord. Put your hands together for the word that has gone forth today.